Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan, your host. To research her books, films, and articles, Sai Montgomery has been chased by an angry silver bat gorilla in Zaire, bitten by a vampire bat in Costa Rica, worked in a pit crawling with 18,000 snakes in Manitoba, and handled wild tarantula in French Guyana. She has been to Borneo, she's been hunted by a tiger in India, and swum with piranhas and eels in the Amazon. But some of Sai's most lyrical writing is about birds, and she has written several wonderful books and articles on them. Her latest is about hummingbirds. For these and many reasons, I have been a longtime fan of Sai, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the podcast. Welcome, Sai. Oh, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be on with your listeners. So um, let's maybe start with your first book about the, maybe start with your first book in which you describe hummingbirds and rehabilitating them. Why don't we go from there? Oh, great. Well, I'd love to talk to you about this because this book is just about to come out just as hummingbirds are migrating to the northeast of the United States. You probably, I'm sure that you know that hummingbirds are unique to North and South America. And these birds, they fascinate me because one, they are incredibly fragile. They are made of air. They are these tiny, tiny birds. The tiniest bird in the world is the bee hummingbird native to Cuba, who's only two inches long and weighs less than a dime. These guys are tiny, but what fascinates me the most is that they are filled with air. Their their bodies are just like bubbles wrapped in these iridescent feathers. And their tininess, their fragility, the fact that they are made of air is what gives them their almost supernatural powers. Because few people realize that the fastest bird in the world if you count for body size, is actually not the peregrine falcon, but it's a hummingbird, a male Allen's hummingbird. As it's showing off to a female, it's screaming down from the sky at 61 miles an hour, plunging 60 feet for every second. That's 385 body lengths per second, which beats the space shuttle. And the longest migrant is also a hummingbird. So they have these superpowers, but they all come from their fragility. Well, I wanted to explore how fragility can be a source of power. And what is more fragile than a hummingbird? An orphaned baby hummingbird. So I had the great pleasure of working with this wonderful bird rehabilitator, Brenda Sherburn LaBelle, who got these two tiny helpless orphans who we had to feed every 20 minutes from dawn till dusk with a syringe, which looked like, you know, the Empire State Building. And you're stuffing it into this this fragile little gaping bill of this vulnerable, darling creature. And it was so essential, though, because if we didn't feed them every 20 minutes, if they didn't get enough food, they would die. But if you fed them too much, because they really are bubbles, they would pop. I found that very moving in the book, how you said the timing of it. So it's nonstop for you. It's totally nonstop. And at first, you know, I I wondered, Brenda has been doing this for many years. She no longer does it. She's trained someone else to do it. It's hard to get someone to commit that amount of time because this goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and you cannot do a workout at the gym. You cannot visit a friend for coffee. You cannot make a phone call of any length. You can't, she's a sculptor. She couldn't work on her sculptures. I couldn't write anything. But just meeting these two little birds and seeing their vulnerability and their need, and yet their incredible appetite for life, I knew that there was no better use of my time and helping one of these, and now two of these darling little babies, reclaim their birthright to own the sky. Um, People who have read The Hummingbird's Gift know this, but essentially it's a narrative of redemption, as you just described. Um, For people who haven't read it, what is the gift that hummingbirds gave you? Why are they worth saving? What a wonderful question. Well, the gift that they gave me was a hand in resurrection. 
these birds would have been dead. They would have been dead in their nest. But to be able to help a creature like that claim the very sky, that's an incredible, empowering, um, it's, it's, it's such a huge gift. I will remember it until the day I die. If I don't do one other thing in my life, I help two baby hummingbirds soar into the sky. They could even still be alive because some of them can live for quite a long time. And just seeing a hummingbird, your heart just soars with them. People adore them. People will do anything to help a hummingbird. And I think that that, that message that we can have a hand in resurrection is so important right now as we come out of the whole, you know, the whole COVID lockdown. COVID will be with us for a while and sometimes it's so easy to despair. But if you can see something that tiny and vulnerable and helpless grow to a creature who's capable of such heights and, and such quickness and such feats, and if you can be blessed by having a hand in that, well, then surely we can mend this beautiful green world. Yeah. We have sunbirds here in India that remind me of your hummingbirds and that they hover. But I learned so much from that book that they can hover upside down. And then I learned there are so many species of hummingbirds. I think you mentioned 250 or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people are still discovering them. Um, I think it's like 330 now. It's an enormous number. They're very varied, but all of them are fairly small. Um, the largest one is eight and a half inches, but it's still smaller than a robin. Yeah. And these guys, I mean, their 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 pace of life is just furious. Yeah. Even one thing they breathe through 250 times a minute, resting, and the heart pounds at 500 beats a minute. I mean. This is, a, this is a creature on fire. It's like a little comet. And they, um, one of them, some, one species migrates across the Gulf of Mexico um, from the United States to Mexico, or they all do that, perhaps. Um, some of them actually are residents in places like California, where we have that great long, um, and sometimes they don't have to go anywhere. But yeah, our, um, on the East Coast, our ruby throat hummingbirds, the only ones we have on the east coast of the United States, they go down to, to Mexico. Um, but in the west, we have so many other species of hummingbirds. And what is so cool is if you go visit South America to see some of our birds down there, it's like, oh, look, I've got a friend here. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, from the hummingbirds, uh, can we move to the largest bird that you've written about, which is the California condors? I uh, read about that. That was a spectacular book. Um, the book, for those who haven't read it, is where um, Sai becomes part of another rescue mission uh, to rehabilitate condors in condor country. But I will let Sai talk about it. Um, uh, for listeners here in India, we don't have condors. Please tell us about condors because... I, for one, um, wasn't aware that they were vultures. Um, right, right. Well, you do have plenty of vultures. I met some of your beautiful vultures. And I'm also aware that vultures are facing some serious problems in India because of uh, di what's it called? diclofenac. Because of diclofenac. Uh, yeah. Vultures, um, vultures are underestimated. They're underappreciated around the world. But the condor is one of those birds that you just can't help but be dazzled by it because of its absolutely astonishing wingspan. It's 10 feet across and it's North America's largest land bird. So it's really no wonder that, that Native Americans revered the condor wherever it was found. It soars to enormous heights. It can see everything. And um, our Native Americans recognized that and believed that the condor had all kinds of magical powers. And really all vultures are performing a miracle because feeding on carcasses, what are they doing? They are taking death and making it into life. But condor comeback is kind of a double resurrection because our California condors were extinct in the wild. 
And I remember this happening. This was in the 80s. And um, what was the exact date? I think I have it, 1982. There were fewer than two dozen of these birds left on the planet. And I remembered this was in 1987 when the last one who was wild was captured and taken into a, a zoo to breed in, in captivity. And that made the condor extinct in the wild. This was an extremely controversial move. And even some of our, our great conservationists felt that it was wrong to take one of these incredible birds who, you know, ruled the skies all over the West and put it in a cage. But it was the only way. No one even knew why these, these birds were going extinct. They kept wondering, is it, are people shooting them? Are they eating poisoned carcasses? You know, what, what, what's going on? And it turned out it was neither of those things. Um, the causes of their extinction are entirely in our hands. And it is two things. It is lead from not being shot by bullets, but feeding on carcasses that have a trail that the bullet leaves of lead in the carcass. So if hunters would use other bullets, it would make the meat that they take home to their children far safer, and it would help save the condor. And the other thing that is killing them is micro trash, tiny bits of trash that the mother and father condors, who are about the best parents you could ever hope for, they actually go out shopping for toys to bring back to the nest. And in the wild, you know, if there wasn't trash thrown everywhere because of humans, they'd bring back little pebbles and little twigs and you know, all kinds of safe things for the babies to explore. But they bring back plastic garbage, bottle caps, bits of glass, pieces of wire. And the chicks swallow these things. The plastic jams up their crops so they cannot eat. The glass grinds through this. It's terrible. And if we would just stop poisoning the world, this would be fine. But uh, they've been trying to save these birds for decades and decades and decades. And it was my great honor to work with the folks uh, connected with the Santa Barbara Zoo and a number of, of, other, um, of other folks at other zoos and with uh, the National Park Service and National Wildlife Service to help take care of these condors. I got to hold a condor on my lap. I yep. got to hold several condors on my lap. I even got bitten by a condor, which was <laughs> thrilling. I got pooped on by a condor, which felt like a baptism. But having this up close experience with this magnificent creature just completely thrilled me. And it was something I could not wait to pass on to others. This is one of those um, very creative conservation efforts. Every single condor that is left on the planet, of which there are now hundreds, hundreds are flying free. But the free flying ones have to, they're so precious that each one has to be recaptured and checked to make sure it is healthy. And they do this every year. So I got to work with Estelle Sandhouse um, and she showed me, you know, how to hold properly hold one of these giant birds um, to have them sitting on your lap looking into that ruby eye and realizing this bird could have been gone but no you know people are joining in the effort to bring these birds back and now again you can see condors flying free and this is thrilling for Native Americans who understand the value of condor medicine and the book also has a chapter on condor medicine. And I got to talk with a Shumash elder who explained how important they are in their culture. They understood what the white interlopers did not. And only now we're starting to understand. I had the pleasure of reading Sai's book about condors in full. And one of the memorable phrases she uses in the book is that saving wild condors was a creative controversial and concerted effort. And all three words are important. And then she talks about how she goes into the condor country and they um, cap, not capture, they bring the birds into a large cage and then a smaller cage and then Sai gets to hold them in her lap 
and then they are given injected with uh, blood samples are drawn it's quite wonderful to listen to it and the other thing i didn't know was that condors are social birds and they are they have they learn very fast from mentors as she calls it in the book so sai what's it like to hold a condor i mean you describe it in detail in the book but please talk about it well i have i've done some falconry in my life and this kind of helped um it's a very large <laughs> a very large bird um but you can feel the bird relax in your arms if you're holding it right um now there's some you just mentioned how their personality plus birds and some birds are bold and some are shy um some are kind of aggressive um and and others are like oh i've been caught so many times for this blood draw and it's nothing it's like going to the dentist for person you know and the 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 ones that i held were generally pretty chill the the uh, the one who bit me it was entirely my fault i could have been badly hurt and i wasn't after after uh, people conduct the health check you know i'm holding it and other people are checking the the beak and the eyes and the crop and the feathers and sometimes they take a feather sample to see if there's lead they blow they draw blood to to test for lead they just want to make sure everybody is healthy um and after all that is done which you try to do as quickly as possible just a, just a minutes um you're supposed to stand up out of the chair holding the bird and then weigh the bird and you but when i leaned forward to get up i was holding the bird's um bill in one hand and i had my arm around the wing and the other wing was held against my chest and um i felt myself slip and i sure did not want to be holding that bird by his neck so i let go and so he bit me but <laughs> what was lovely was holding the bird right against you and you know that when you're calm you transfer that calmness to whoever's around you and we know this is true with people and we know it's true with animals with their super senses and i know i could feel the bird calm in my grasp and that was a tremendous tremendous thing um each one is totally different as you pointed out and some of them have a sense of humor they have a great sense of the group one of the great things i learned from estelle was um once they caught um they had a group of of condors at the zoo and one day all the condors went out and picked all the flowers in the exhibit and lined them up together That's Why like, that? <laughs> oh, yeah. That. yeah. Everyone in Hancock, New Hampshire where I live, we just had a snow as I was mentioning earlier and everybody has rushed out to pick their daffodils so they don't get wrecked and I kept thinking of all of, uh, like vultures, you know, like big yeah. condors rushing out yeah. and picking picking flowers in those yeah. big beaks to display them. There's that lovely passage in the in the book where you say you can feel the condor's heartbeat and the condor can feel your heartbeat and you're holding the beak and you're relaxing and it's relaxing it's almost like holding a baby i guess um, yeah. the transmission of the the senses and then there's also the section where you say um uh, your the, the the man who taught you he actually pulls the condor's neck back because the power uh, of their uh, it comes from jutting forward or something like that the condors it, um actually it comes from pulling back because mm -hmm. they, they are ripping the the flesh of their prey and if you've already pulled them to you um they don't have that much forward motion so okay. you you've kind of taken their strength um but i love that it's pulling it to you yeah. you know because a lot of a lot of people are like I'm not sure I want to pour pull a vulture to me. Yeah. But you know you would think too vultures people think oh you know messy gross they're feeding on it minutes before I was holding this bird it was feeding on a carcass and you you would think like oh they're so dirty they're extremely clean birds I mean they're constant they love having a bath they love fixing their feathers um they smell nice actually and their breath the breath of a condor if the condor is healthy smells like a freshly cut carrot oh my god so yeah. this is literally taking death into life they are eating yeah. carcasses but their breath is nothing like death nothing like no. 
a carcass. Okay. It smells wow. like a, a lovely fresh carrot. Hmm. Um, Sai, in India, we talk a lot about conservation and things that we uh, we can do, um, behaviors to change. Um, tell us about lead bullets and copper bullets, because uh, uh, that's a big part of the effort for conservation. Yes, absolutely. And I know that everyone who's working for condor conservation wants to work with hunters, not against them. They, they want it very clear that they're not against hunters. Um, copper washed bullets do not lead a, leave a toxic trail as they enter their target. And so if you are hunting with a copper washed bullet, the meat that you take home is clean. It's not going to poison your wife and children or your husband and children or yourself. So it's much better for the hunters. And hunters say that these bullets are very accurate. Now, they, they cost a little bit more but not that much more. And when you look at the cost of hunting itself as a sport, this is the least of your expenditures. Uh, guns are very expensive and you need a permit and you're driving a long distance and it's it's nothing. It's, it's as if you were going on a, a vacation to a beach and haggling over the price of the swimsuit saying, oh, I, I can't take my beach vacation. I can't, my swimsuit costs too much. So, to be able to save the condor and to be able to save the other animals that feed on carcasses uh, that may be poisoned with lead is a huge, huge thing. And we can all have a hand in that. And I mean, California, you know, what's California that? there's a law against uh, lead bullets, right? California? In some, yeah, in California, there is. In a lot of other states, there's not. And um, it's it's very frustrating. It's it's an issue also with fishermen with lead sinkers. Um, another iconic bird in New England is the loon. This beautiful black and white bird with a long bill that dives to great depths and has that wonderful wavering eerie call. They are dying because of lead sinkers, mm -hmm. and. You know, fishermen don't intend to lose their sinker, but you're going to. I mean, sinkers are going to be lost and they're going to stay at the bottom of the lake or pond and animals are going to find them and they're going to swallow them mm -hmm. and they're going to kill them. And the way lead kills is that it's taken up in the body um, and into the nervous system. So the way it, it kills you, I mean, it sickens you in all kinds of ways, but one of the first symptoms, as we know from lead paint and children, children who've eaten lead paint, we note that their IQs keep falling on tests. Well, if you're a bird and you're flying, you have got to have your IQ functioning at you know a very high level. You need your wits about you if you are flying. And so while lead poisoning, you have to accumulate a bit before it kills you like, you know, strychnine, just affecting your mental acuity, that's enough to kill a bird. Even a tiny, tiny dose can kill a bird. Which bird would you like to talk about next? Because you've met emus in Australia, you have uh, your book on birdology has a list of birds. Um, shall we talk about hawks or crows or emus or falconry if you wish? Boy, well, I would love to tell you about um, emus because they were kind of, they showed me my destiny. Um, I, I write about them in a memoir called How to Be a Good Creature. And it was really my, my first dog when I was tiny who showed me what I wanted to do for a living. I wanted to learn the secrets of animals. I was only three when Molly came to me and I wanted to be a dog, but Everyone wanted to teach me how to be a little girl, not a dog. So I had no one to teach me until I had Molly. She's the one that showed me that I really wanted to pursue a life of studying animals. But how was I gonna do this? Emus were the ones who literally showed me the path by letting me follow them. I had worked for a newspaper for five years right out of college covering science and environment and loved it. 
and had a chance to take a vacation with an organization called Earthwatch, pairs paying laymen with projects around the world. And um, when I when I took a vacation with them, I discovered I worked with um, Dr. Pamela Parker in Australia on a wombat preserve for the Southern Hairy Nose Wombat. And I fell in love with field research so much so that when she said, look, you know, I can't pay you to come back. I'd love to. I wish you could be my assistant. I can't give you a ticket to come back. But if you ever wanted to study anything here at my research center, which was a bunch of tents in the middle of the outback, I'll give you food. So I quit my job and I moved to a tent in the outback, not knowing what I would study, giving up, you know, income and health insurance, but I had food. Well, I was out helping a, a graduate student with a, a study of her own. She was in another part of the park and I was over here collecting um, a particular plant that she was going to uh, check for nitrogen content. I was bent over and I was cutting these plants and putting them into a, a paper bag. And somehow I felt someone was there. I looked up and three birds taller than a man were just strolling by in front of me. And I'd never seen anything like this. <laughs> as you know, are you know as, as tall as a person, they can't fly. They have these little eight-inch wing stumps, and they their feathers hang down like hair. They really look like they look more like people than than they they do birds. But they are in fact birds. They're everything a bird is. They just can't fly. So these three individuals are walking past me, and I felt. Like I'd just been visited by an angel. I couldn't believe it. And they, they, they had to have seen me because bird's eyesight, as you know, is really excellent. But they behaved as if I wasn't there. And I was smitten. And I decided I've got to study these guys. Now, I never thought I'd actually see them again, but I noticed that they had left a big poop. For, and I rushed up to look at it. It was like a something discarded from an alien spaceship. You just couldn't wait to see like what's in this. And there were seeds in it. And I thought, gosh, they must be important seed dispersers. I'll find out what these seeds are. I will. Well, that was a very interesting project in its own. But soon I found myself bumping into these emus everywhere I went. And since I wore the same thing every day, a bright red kerchief and my father's green army jacket and jeans, they quickly learned to recognize me. And soon I could follow them just walking a few paces and back of these three young adolescent emus. And I recorded all of their behavior and I kind of became one of their flock. <laughs> You're very poetic in describing the presence of an animal. Having never seen an emu, what is the presence of an emu? What, is it, uh, what does it emanate? What, what is the personality of an emu? Or the they're very, they're very curious. Mm. That's something I've, I've found out. They're very, I mean, I think every animal is intelligent in its own way, but the intelligence of an emu, I think is something that we can recognize because it's similar to our own. And I later learned they also have a sense of humor, very similar to our own. One day when I was following them, they went out to the ranger's house and he had a dog on, on a chain out back. And they wanted to tease the dog because of course dogs like to run after everything. And they knew that this dog would love to chase them and maybe even to bite them and eat them. But they knew about chains. So what they did, they knew the length of the chain. They walked up so that the dog would be running all the way out to the length of the chain and that the dog would be forced to stop. And they just started going crazy. They were like splashing the air with their feet. They were throwing their necks up and their heads up. They were taking their little eight inch wing stubs and wiggling them around just to make the dog go crazy. And they did this for several minutes. And then when they were done, they strolled back 
a little distance away and sat down and preened themselves. <laughs> as if to say, you know, as if they were rubbing their nails on their on their shirt and blowing them to polish them. They were like, that was entertaining, wasn't it? We really got the best of that dog. <laughs> um there's a number of books you list in the in that book in which you describe the emus. Can you uh, do you remember a couple of them that we can pass on to our listeners? Books that you love among nature writing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, gosh, one of my one of my favorite books ever was Never Cry Wolf by Farley Moat, Canada's most famous storyteller. And what that book showed me was that you know, it's great to, to have facts. Um, it's even better to have a story and it's best to grab your reader's heart if you want them to live in a way that will respect animals and conserve animals. So the emotional content of that book really mattered very deeply to me. He's a wonderful and humorous writer and he was very good to me when I was researching my first book about Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall, and Barute Galdikas. He invited me to stay in his house. I couldn't believe it. This this man who was the, the famous writer and I was just starting out. So God bless Farley Moat. Um, I, I loved, deeply, deeply loved Diane Fossey's first book, her account of living with mountain gorillas called Gorillas in the Mist. And that book, like Farley's, is still in print and um, all of the books that Jane Goodall has written, which are wonderful, including the chimpanzees of Gombe. Um, I love reading about insects um, and so have loved the work of Howard Ensign Evans. Um, in the back of the book, what, what other books do I talk about? Gosh, there's, there's so many, but those I picked because they were books as I was a young young person, as I was a young writer, these were books that really helped me see um, how writing can help us to appreciate and understand the wonder of animals. In your book, The Wild Outside Your Window, you talk about the woodpecker's song which is leads up to my question. The question I ask all guests is, uh, what are some of their favorite species of birds? So feel free to talk about the woodpecker song or any other species of bird that you like. Oh, gosh. Well, we, we have a ton of woodpeckers right now. Interestingly, in North America, um, many bird species are declining, but woodpecker species are generally increasing. And we have four species of woodpecker, probably, I mean, I can't see the feeder from where I'm sitting because I'd never get any work done, but we have four species of woodpecker regularly visiting our suet feeder. Woodpeckers are a riot. They attract, not only do they, do they um, peck to find food, but they also drum to attract females. And this time of year, there's always a woodpecker in your town who has found some metal object that's gonna wake everyone on the block up, but he's really gonna get attention from all the lady woodpeckers because he knows what makes the best sound. They are such musicians. Most birds are musicians only with their voices, but these guys actually use percussive instruments to attract their lady friends. And woodpeckers are gorgeous animals. I love the way they, they walk, they kind of can creep up the, the tree and their skulls are, are fascinating. I mean, could you imagine what a headache you would get if you spent your whole day banging your head against a tree? But their brains are specially cushioned in their, in their uh, skulls and their tongues, which they use to pry inside the holes that they make, they're way longer than their head and to withdraw it into their head, they have to wrap it around in this bizarre manner. Hummingbirds do that too. Hummingbirds' tongues also are enormous and they extrude them in this wild way. Hummingbirds are another one of my favorite birds, of course, for so many reasons. And I think that that is shared by, by many people. But um, another bird that I absolutely adore um, is the cassowary, another flightless bird in Australia, because it looks exactly like a dinosaur. Hmm. And they remind us that birds actually are dinosaurs. We were told the dinosaurs went extinct. 
but they didn't. They grew wings and you're eating it at your Thanksgiving table if you're not a vegetarian like me, and you're seeing dinosaurs at your feeder every day. That is what became of them. And the cassowary has this enormous helmet of bone that reminds you of so many of, of those dinosaurs, you know, that you, that you can see at, the, at your local uh, natural history museum. Um, and they actually have been known to kill people. They, they kill more people than any other bird, but they, they, they're doing it for a perfectly good reason. It's because the people are trying to kill and eat them. So they usually try to get to it first. They have a killing claw, which makes them even more dinosaurian, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I went to, I, I went to Papua New Guinea where there are a lot of these birds, but they are hiding because the people eat them. Then I went to Queensland, Australia into the rainforest there to try to meet a cassowary. And I spent all kinds of time coming back covered with leeches, bleeding like I'd been shot. And then on my last day in Queensland, because my bus was delayed, I had extra time. I went up to the mountain, into the forest, just one last time to sit there and say goodbye to the beautiful rainforest. And as I was sitting there, again, like an angel, this cassowary, comes out of the forest almost soundlessly, this huge bird with giant feet. I could see the claw, they were close enough. I could see the, I could see the pupil of the eye. I could see the eyelashes on the bird. And the, the amazing thing is it had to have seen this like woman with yellow hair sitting there, but the bird completely ignored me. It was as if I had been transported back into time where there were no people and got to watch an, a dinosaur walk past me. Oh my God. And so I've never, again, these are huge birds with huge, uh, how tall, six feet or four feet? They're more like uh, four and a half feet. Uh, yeah. But that is a big bird. It is a yeah. big bird. And like the emu, they have, um, their feathers look like hair hanging down. But their feathers, unlike the, the haystack brown of an emu, they're black as night. And they have these blue necks and they have these red wattles. And then they have that tall cask or helmet of bone. People are still trying to figure out what that thing is for. Um, one of my good friends has uh, been studying this for many years and he believes it might be um, involved in receiving or creating sound. Hmm. Huh. And it moves quietly. It's you said it came quietly out of the or it makes Yes. Noise. Yes, it's amazing how how quiet animals are. Even elephants, as you know. I mean, I don't know if you have you had a chance to, to come yep. upon an elephant in the forest. Yep. You can't hear the elephant. It's an no. elephant. <laughs> but, Everyone is quiet in the forest except for us. We yep. are always smashing and crashing and breaking every twig there is. Yep. But birds are remarkably quiet. Elephants are remarkably quiet. Tigers yep. are very quiet. Tigers are are silent. Yeah. In your book, Birdology, you talk about multiple birds. Um, uh, we ha uh, Tell us about hawks first. Oh, wow. Well, I, uh, in order to research a chapter on hawks, um, I learned falconry at the knee of a master falconer, um, uh, Nancy Cowan. And the very first lesson I, I, I went to, I, I went with my friend, Celinda. And so each of us had a bird on our, on our glove and um, including the instructor. Well, within seconds, her bird, which was a peregrine falcon, bit her in the face and blood was like dripping down her face. And she treated this like it was nothing. She treated it like it was a mosquito bite. It was like, oh, well, she does that sometimes. And meanwhile, I have this, <laughs> I had a red, uh, no, I had a, um, a, I had a Harris's hawk um, whose name was Fire and who was feisty on my glove because I had a choice and it, I wanted to take the fiery one. And my friend who I had convinced to take the class with me, I didn't want her to have the one that was fiery. Anyway, oh my God, birds are fierce. I mean, 
they are dinosaurs. And many, many birds, even birds we think of as seed eaters, actually love uh, meat, whether it's the meat of a worm or the meat of a rat or the meat of a rabbit. And when you, when you see a, a hawk take a rabbit or a quail, the, the concentrated ferocity, the, the intensity of, if they call it yarrick, there's a word for this because it's, it's so integral to hawks. And when they are in yarrick, there is no stopping them. And I admire this. Although I'm a vegetarian myself, I deeply admire that focus, that intensity, that ferocity. It is, it is the essence of wildness. It is the essence of where birds come from. They come from not the plant-eating dinosaurs. They come from the, the wing of dinosaurs to which Tyrannosaurus rex belonged. And you see that when you've got a hawk that leaves your glove for the hunt. And I'm a nonviolent person. You know, I literally won't hurt flies. I'll take them outside. But watching a hawk pursue and get its prey is almost a holy thing. Unbelievable. How beautiful. What in that? So how do you spell Yarek? Uh, Y-A-R-A-K. Y-A-R-A-K. I'll look it up. Yeah. Um, that is so poetic. And um, we have crows in India about which you write about as well. And uh, oh, I've the crows. They're fabulous. <laughs> yeah. But you have a different version or you, you, your experience is a little different with crows. Sure. Well, in birdology, um, I write about an aggregation, a huge roost of crows. And it became very controversial in this smallish city in, in New York, Auburn. Um, some people saw this enormous aggregation of crows as a wonder of nature. Thousands and thousands of crows would stream in and they almost blacken the sky. It was a beautiful sight. And they were all calling and talking to each other. And as you know, uh, crows are very smart. They're very social. And at these roosts, they probably are exchanging all kinds of information about a good place to be and um, where the food is. And so, you know, you're watching a really interesting natural history event and seeing thousands of thousands of birds in one place. But other people did not want to see thousands of birds in one place. They looked at the crows as a nuisance. They felt like, goodness, you know, they're, they're pooping on your car. They're... Um, they're making a mess. They're making too much noise. So they wanted to disperse this roost in downtown Auburn. So it provided a way to, to look at how people look at crows. And one of the things that I find interesting about our take on other animals is frequently the animals that are most like us are the ones we most despise. And when we're mad at them, we're mad at them for doing things that we do. So, you know, people aggregate in cities. People make a huge mess. People have made a whole mess of the globe, you know, half of the, the ocean is gonna be filled with plastic by 2050. It's gonna have more plastic than fish. So who are we to talk about an animal making a mess? Um, we congregate in enormous numbers and make a lot of noise. But because crows were doing this, we were like, no, we don't want to have that. There had been crow hunts in Auburn. Prizes were given out for the most crows someone could kill. But now Auburn was trying a different method, and that was to disperse them, to scare them away, to make them go into the woods which uh, would bother people much less. I find and, it. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said I find it interesting because of what you just said because I thought you would say people like birds that are like them, but you said that's the opposite. People despise birds that are like them, and the yeah. crow, crow example. Yeah, that's. So I think so. Yeah. I, I think so. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 
I want to end with uh, the chapter on parents, which uh, I, which you uh, ha- talk about and um, how smart they are and the African gray parrot. Um, so please t- tell us a little bit about that chapter as well. Oh, that was a fun chapter to research. I started it by, on my birthday, flying uh, halfway across the country to dance with a cockatoo. <laughs> no more the dancing cockatoo. He was the celebrity. And what he did that was so cool, I mean, lots, lots of animals can be taught to dance. I, I've been taking canine freestyle dancing lessons with my dog. But what birds can do is they can synchronize to the beat of a song. And there's been studies on this. It, it's been thought to be only a human trait, of course, but it's not. Lots of birds can sync to the beat, as it turns out. And you can see this if you go on YouTube and just ask to see some dancing bird videos. There's tons of them and they actually keep on the beat. And so I got to dance with this cockatoo and Snowball, he was an unwanted bird. Um, He'd been loved and he'd been living in a, a home where he was a celebrated member of the family. But then the daughter who he loved went to college. And when she came back, he was furious with her. He thought he was pretty much her mate. And it's like, where have you been? I thought you were eaten by an owl. (laughs) But no. So then he began to attack her. And because the the beaks are so strong, they can exert like 400 pounds of pressure per square inch. They had to give the bird to a a bird rescue. And uh, when they did, they handed her a CD and said, just play this and see what happens. Well, the CD was a recording of the song that he really liked. It was it was called Everybody. And uh, he totally rocked out. His crest fly, flew up and he used his wings and he waggled his tail and he swung his head. And this was a great way to discuss the, in, the intelligence of birds that is so like ours that they enjoy what we enjoy. And in the case of birds who talk, they can speak to us in our language. They can speak to us in English. And another part of that chapter was the Alex studies, a number of um, African gray parrots who live with um, Irene Pepperberg have been taught to speak meaningfully. So you can ask them questions. You can show a tray of objects and ask, she could ask Alex, he's passed on now, but she would say, you know, what color is this? And he would say green. And then she would say, you know, what's what's it made out of? What matter is it? He'd say wood, or he'd say wool, or he'd say, you know, he would tell you these things. And sometimes he would speak about his feelings spontaneously. Wow. And the last thing Alex said before he died of a heart attack was, um, good night, I love you, see oh. you tomorrow. Oh. That, that's heartwarming. Yeah. What a chapter. Anyway, Sai, uh, I mean, I've asked you all the questions I have listed. Any other things that you would like to leave us with or talk about before we end? Well, just how grateful I am to be talking with you and with listeners who appreciate the wonder of birds. For so many of us, it's the only wild animals that we see every day. And so every time we see a bird, it's a burst of wildness and wonder sent to bless us. And I think that they deserve our reverence and our respect. And there's so many ways that we can help birds. And we should think about that every single day. Simon Montgomery, thank you very much for being in the Bird Podcast. Thank you so much. Bird Podcast is produced by Ullas Anand and Echo Edu. I'm Shobha Narayan. Thank you for listening.